To our early forefathers, the wind must have seemed an awe-inspiring mystery. The wind in the willows, sighing like a solitary soul alone, says the old round. At times it howled round his ears as if trying to frustrate his efforts to struggle against it. We do not know when he first discovered that he could make it his servant. We do know that 5,000 years ago the Egyptians used the power of the wind to sail their boats. But it was not till 800 years ago that the wind was first used as a source of power on land. The first windmill we know of in England was in existence in 1175. This mill at Bourne in Cambridgeshire is the oldest one now surviving and was in use as long ago as 1636. Those early mills were called post mills as the whole structure was carried on a central post. To bring the sails into the wind the mill had to be turned by a long lever called the tail pole. The whole mill revolved round the post, which was supported on a trestle. At Bourne, the trestle is open, but later it was bricked in in many cases to form a shed called a roundhouse used for storing grain. The post mill was succeeded in the 17th century by the smock mill, so called from a fancied resemblance to a man wearing a smock. It was first introduced by the Dutch to drain the fens and was usually quite small. The smock mill consisted of a stationary wooden tower with the sails carried on a revolving cap. These sails were turned into the wind by a tail pole attached to the cap and reaching nearly to the ground. At the lower end, a winch and chain was fitted. The chain was unwound and hooked round one of a series of small posts which surrounded the mill. The winch was then wound up, pulling round the tail pole, which in turn pulled the cap and sails into the wind. Then it was wedged in position with a stout wooden beam. There used to be a great many of these small mills for draining the fens. A few were quite large, like this one here at Soham Mere in Cambridgeshire. Only two of its four sails are left. At the back, you see the circular casing covering the huge water wheel. The smock mill was soon adapted for grinding corn. Here is a very fine one still working at Cranbrook in Kent. The Sibsey Trader Mill in Lincolnshire, with its six sails, shows us the windmill in all its pride and beauty. The wooden tower of the smock mill has been replaced by one made of brick or stone, and the tower mill, as this type is called, gives us the windmill in its most perfect form. Here is another fine tower mill, a huge eight-sailer at Heckington, the only one remaining in England. And this curiosity is the only surviving example of the annular mill. It is now in very bad condition. 
Not only had the main structure of mills been developed through the years, but the method of moving the sails into the wind. And also the sails themselves had been improved in design. You will notice that this mill has a small set of sails at the back called a fantail. As the mills grew larger, so they became too heavy to be turned easily by hand. And in 1750, Andrew Michael invented the fantail to do this work. On post mills, the fan was first fitted on the existing tail poles, as you see on this one, cross in hand in Sussex. The fan drove some gears, which turned two large wheels supporting the tail pole on the ground. These wheels ran in a track round the mill and turned it into the wind. It was soon found that the tail pole was a bad place for the fan, as it was too low down to catch the wind. So it was moved higher up onto a special framework built on the ladder, as in this post mill at Woolpit in Suffolk. Similar gearing drove the wheels, which in this case support the ladder and run as before on a track round the mill. The name Woolpit comes from Wolf Pit, and the village is haunted by the ghost of the last wolf to be killed in this country, known affectionately as Old Shag. The fan tail was finally placed on the roof of the mill where high above surrounding buildings and sheltering trees it could catch even the gentlest breeze. The gearing in this case was rather different. The fan drove a shaft at the back of the mill which was geared to a worm wheel on the post itself. The ladder was still mounted on wheels running on a track but these no longer turned the mill, being only for support. Fan tails were also fitted to smock and tar mills. On these, they were placed on a balcony at the back of the cap. The gearing worked on a toothed rack running round the top of the tower. Before the fan tail was invented, a similar rack was used on tower mills, but the gearing was worked by hand by means of a chain running over a large wheel and reaching to the ground. This mill in Anglesey was the last of this type to work, but has been idle and derelict for several years. In the early mills, the sails were frameworks of wood covered with heavy canvas. These are called common sails. To spread the canvas, the break of the mill is first released. The miller then walks round to the front and with a hooked pole pulls down a sail. On goes the brake again. The canvas is unrolled. Hooked at one side halfway up the framework. and then spread. It slips like a curtain along a rod at the top of the sail. 
Ropes from the edge of the canvas are drawn tight round the back of the sail and secured. The other three sails are prepared in the same way and the mill is ready to grind corn or pump water. The spreading of canvas takes time, so a better type of sail was invented in 1772 by Andrew Michael. This is the spring sail. It consists of a wooden framework on which are hinged wooden or canvas shutters connected by a rod and held closed against the wind by a spring. If the wind is strong, mill sails like boat sails have to be reefed. With a spring sail, this is done by opening the shutters a little so that less surface is exposed to the wind. To do this, the mill has to be stopped. But in 1807, Sir William Cubitt invented a sail which could be reefed while the mill was running and which is now called the patent sail. In this type, the connecting rods of the shutters are hinged by bell cranks to a rod passing through the middle of the axle on which the sails turn. The pushing to and fro of this rod, therefore, alters the angle of the shutters. The back end of this rod is attached to a chain which passes over a pulley and hangs down the back of the mill. On this chain are hung weights which keep the shutters in position against the wind. Both patent and common sails were built on a curve. This made them far more efficient than flat surfaces would have been. An important point in the construction of a mill is the method of joining onto the axle the stocks or beams on which the sails are built. One method is by fitting them into heavy cast iron sockets. This smock mill which has two sails missing shows this clearly. Here are some iron sockets on the ground. The other method is to bolt each stock onto an iron cross, as you can clearly see in this six sailor with only four sails left. Here is a millstone which actually does the work of grinding. Two of these stones are used, face to face, but not quite touching. The grain is fed between them. One stone is stationary and the other turning. Millstones have to be dressed periodically, as otherwise the grain would not be properly ground. Tommy Ward of Sibsey Trader Mill shows how this should be done. It is very skilled work and requires years of experience. Attached to the axle of the sails is a huge wheel of wood or iron. This wheel has teeth which run in mesh with another gear wheel fixed onto a shaft running down the centre of the mill. Owing to this central position, the cap of the mill can revolve without bringing the gears out of mesh. This shaft carries another gear which in turn drives the stones. There are generally at least two pairs of stones. In big mills, there may be four or even six. A governor regulates the gap between the stones. The power of the sails is also used to haul sacks of grain to the top of the mill. Before it was discovered that steam could be made to work for man and drive his machinery, there were thousands of windmills in Britain, pumping and draining the fens and grinding corn into flour. Less than 200 are now working.
and every year a few more stop never to start again. A few mills still work with two sails missing, but more frequently the loss of a sail means death, and the mill is abandoned, for sails are expensive and the miller generally cannot afford a new one. Sometimes a mill is preserved as a thing of beauty and a relic of past glory. Often the machinery rots where it stands. The sails fall off and moulder on the ground. Only an empty hulk is left behind. Once this was a beautiful symbol of man's industry. Now a gaunt and derelict wreck, and so they rest. Even of those mills still working, only a few can earn their keep in this industrial age, like this one at Ramsey. The only modern equivalent to the windmill is the wind pump, lacking both the power and the dignity of its predecessor. The wind, which was once the driving power of industry, is now used only for sport and recreation. Gliders soar and float upon it. Kites may be seen dancing upon it on any windy day. Yachts, real and model, catch the wind in their sails on sea or lake. But no longer does the miller wait until the wind from place to place doth the unmoved cloud galleons chase. The wind blows on, but no man uses it.